Well, let's come around God's Word again this morning, shall we? And uh, we're going to speak about power. Powerful or powerless? <laughs> it, it, it's been very interesting this week, hasn't it? Um, when you think of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I, I, my heart goes out to him when you, when you think he, he took on the role of being Chancellor, um, came out for us out of nowhere, We'd never heard of him before probably, and suddenly he's thrust into the role of being Chancellor of the Exchequer. And, <laughs> and then within, within a matter of a few days, it would seem, certainly within a few weeks, Lo and behold, he's got a, a pandemic to, to work his way at through. And, I mean, some of the decisions and the, the brave stances that he's taken, and uh, it's been absolutely incredible. And, and it's the powerful position that he holds that gives him the authority to be able to make those decisions uh, that are either going to help us through the crisis or... Um, cause things to go even worse. So that's been in my mind to, today as we've heard him bring the uh, the budget this week and all manner of everybody's opinion as to whether he's got it right or whether he's got it wrong. Well, I'm not going to talk about that this morning, but I'm just going to, it just helps me to reference the power, full or powerless, and what the Bible has to say about it. Romans 5, verses 6 and 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died died for us. You may remember um, on my birthday uh, in 1981, there was an assassination attempt uh, of Ronald Reagan when uh, I think his name was John Hinckley Jr., uh, who was a, a, a bodyguard, um, took the bullet for, um, for the president. And a, a gentleman called James Brady um, died and, or was paralyzed after the shooting. I mean, someone might possibly dare to die for the President of the United States, as in that happened that case. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. And we've done nothing good. <laughs> There's nothing good that we can claim, lay hold to. There's no powerful position that we hold that makes us worthy. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death. That word law can be translated power. So, through Jesus Christ, the power of the spirit of life sets me free from the power of sin and death. And then Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. Why is it that everybody wants power? Everybody's seeking after power. I mean, maybe um, when there's a general election, <laughs> you know, they're all seeking after the power to, to, to be in, in government, to run the country, and then the pandemic happens and they wish they didn't win. <laughs> they wish they were the opposition. But why? Why is everybody striving for power. And then when they think they've found it, want to hold on to it at all costs, not wanting to let go or share it with anybody, not wanting to let it go. The reason? Because we all know that actually man, mankind, is powerless. 
Paul says. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Man is looking for power, striving to gain power, simply because he knows deep down, inside, his spirit man, the real person, the real you, feels and knows and understands and recognizes I'm powerless. So are you feeling powerless today? Helpless? Unable to, to work out where the future lies? What's the next step? How am I going to get through the day? How am I going to get through the month? What is it I can do now? Maybe for folks who've lost their jobs, their identity for many, many years had been what they did rather than who they are. And now having lost their job, they've lost their identity, so they think. But in Christ, you can be a new creation, a new creature with an identity, a identity that's found in God. All too many people feel like giving up because the sense of overwhelming powerlessness has taken over. And then the sad fact that men and women are powerless to do anything about it. When we were still powerless, we can't do anything about it. We can, yes, you can retrain, and yes, you can, you can do job searches, and yes, you can do all the things to try and balance the books, you, you, as the government is trying to do, you know, planning ahead for years ahead, and this is going to take decades to repay all the debt. So a plan is in place to try and, and, and work out how they're going to do it. And so on a household basis, you, you cut back on all the unnecessary expenditure and try and find ways to increase the income to balance the books. There's all manner of arrangements and plans in place to try and sort things out. But we know in and of ourselves we are helpless. We need God's help. Powerless individuals. Folks, sadly, are powerless to break habits, change attitudes. Oh, they'd love to have a different outlook on life. Oh, they, what they would give if only they could be more positive, if they could only see the bright side, if only they could recognize the glass as half full instead of half empty. Everybody wants to try and find an answer that brings them from the place of feeling helpless and hopeless and powerless as to where they are today, that in themselves they can change, that they're powerless to do it. For those with habits, we've talked about at the beginning of the service today, those who are sadly so caught up in the, in the drug scene, having made the mistake of submitting to peer pressure and going down the line of taking illicit drugs and then because of that one mistake, that one night, now they're hooked and now they can't give up. And if only, if only the, all the rehearsing of what's happened in the past goes on and on. And as we read in Psalm 38, the, the pain and the agony, the trauma that continues physically, emotionally, psychologically, and of course spiritually powerless. Very many people, actually, those who have been successful in life and run their own businesses and run corporations and have their CEOs and etc., they're, they're powerful. They have power to make decisions, and unfortunately, they go on power trips. <laughs> and that's unfortunately what happens. A power trip will, in the end, trip you up. Power exercised in the wrong way will, with the wrong motives, certainly end up being a disaster. So my question this morning is, what are we going to do about this powerless problem? Well, first of all, 
Of course, the issue, like for David in Psalm 38, was to recognize the problem. David recognized, he says, that my foolish sin, what a ridiculous thing I did. What a mess I made of my life. And on this particular 12-month period, from the time that he made the mistake of going with Bathsheba and the time when Nathan came to see him, is reckoned to be about a year. And so in that intervening year, David went through hell. It was absolutely dreadful. Now, he comes to this place in Psalm 38 of recognizing the mess that he's made. This is a disaster. He's recognizing the problem. He's not running away from it. He's not hiding from it. He's admitting to it. And as soon as he does that, he starts to feel somewhat better. It's interesting that at the start of the psalm, we have David's cry. It's, it's an anguished cry. He's absolutely distraught, calling on God not to hurt him, not to break him, not to finish him off. And then at the end of the psalm, it's a cry. It's a cry with some confidence in a God who is his Lord and Savior, who, who's going to come to his rescue. You see, David recognized his problem at just the right time. God's at work in your life, and he's at work in my life, and his timing is always perfect. <laughs> you might think he's late. You might think he's very late on occasion. He's never early. We can probably all say, yep, he's never early. But he's never late either. He always demonstrates perfect timing when we were still powerless at just the right time. When we admit to the problem, it's then that we become aware that God has actually already done something about our powerless problem. And what he did was increase incredibly powerful. God didn't think about doing something. He didn't sort of have a, a time of mm, reconsideration. He didn't even try to do. We, we, we like to try. I'll try and be there. <laughs> I'll try and phone you back. I'll, in other words, you're not going to do it. God didn't try. He did it. God dealt with the problem emphatically. Christ died for the ungodly. It's God's perfect timing. He saw man's powerlessness, and he sees your powerlessness today. Powerless to deal with the power of sin. God knew that there was no hope for any of us to break free from sin and its power. So, to be able to deal with this powerless problem, Christ died. He died for you. He died for me. Well, how can we say that he's so powerful? Let's just read from Matthew chapter 9. The first eight verses. Matthew chapter 9 says, Jesus climbed into a boat and went across the lake to his own town. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, be my child, your sins are forgiven. And some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up. And he went home. Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen, and they praised God for giving humans such authority. <laughs> wow. 
What authority and power Jesus had. Unquestionable. When he recognized the helplessness of the, of the individual, the powerlessness of the man's situation, he didn't hold back. And when he spoke with authority and power, they criticized him. How could, how could, do you think you're God? How can you say that? And she said, okay, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? And to prove I am who I say I am, he did both. Forgiving the man's sin and telling him to get up and walk, and the man got up and walked. You see, if you know Jesus today as your saviour, you can depend on him. His power at work in you. That's a wonderful, wonderful verse in Colossians where Paul says that he knew in his weakness, in his feeling of helplessness, in his feeling of exhaustion, that God's power was at work in him. Wow, that's what kept him going. That's what gave him the drive and the focus to continue on his missionary journeys. Jesus alone has the power to forgive sin. And so he alone has the power to break the power of sin over our lives. You might question whether he has the power and authority to do that, but he has. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus said to them, all authority, all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. <coughs> so, number one, he assured them of his power. Number two, he gave them a commission. And number three, he promised them his presence. We've looked at that a few weeks ago. He assures them he has the authority to do that. The one who was dead and is alive. Wow, never seen that before. <laughs> well, actually they had seen Lazarus die and come back to life at the power and authority of Jesus' command. But Lazarus was going to die. He wasn't going to escape death continually. But Jesus, he died, he rose again, <laughs> and now he's about to say goodbye. Death could not hold him. But before he goes, he gives them a commission. He gives them a charge. He gives them something, a great commission to fulfill, to do. And it's for us to continue. And then he promises, I'm going to be with you whenever you go. It was clear. All authority, all power. God the Father had given it to the Son. Now it's, oh, over to you and me. <laughs> Jesus has the power to change your life, to rearrange your priorities and sort out your struggles, your habits, your hang-ups. So today, if you feel powerless, then it's the power and authority of Christ in you that can bring you through. For those who feel unable to cope, unable to break habits, unable to love those around you, unable to break the chains, the habits of sin, etc. Jesus has the power and authority to help, but you must ask him. He will not force himself on anybody. Recognizing your problem and then calling on him, like David at the end of the psalm. His call was to you, O Lord God, my Savior. Call on him to be your Savior. Secondly, <clears throat> recognize the power of sin. Today, if you recognize the powerless problem in yourself for the first time, you can be sure that the devil will come and whisper in your ear, but there's nothing really to worry about, is there? You know, there's... Listen, there's no power in sin. It doesn't matter. It won't harm you. Just one. Well, if you are powerless, well, so what? Everybody else is in the same boat, aren't they? But my Bible tells me that sin is powerful. Powerful enough to kill us. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God 
is eternal life. You see, you won't find anybody who has just been through bereavement who will tell you that death isn't powerful. Of course it is. Death brings end to life on this planet Earth. Physical life comes to an end. Death separates loved ones. Death breaks the heart. It shatters dreams and hopes. With over 120,000 deaths from the pandemic in just the United Kingdom over this last 12 months, it's brought death in a situation that was not anticipated or expected at all for many, many people. Sin is powerful because its wage is powerful. It, if the sin problem isn't dealt with, then after physical death comes separation from God. <clears throat> it's not just the physical death, it's the spiritual death. That's what's to be avoided. Physical death is just, well, that's the nature of life on earth as human beings. But you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Just because your body dies, that's not the end. Your spirit lives on. And what you need to avoid today is spiritual death. God is holy. He's perfect. He cannot even look on sin, the Bible says. And sin is powerful because it deceives you. Hebrews 3 verse 13 says, But encourage one another daily. Every day, encourage each other. As long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Hmm. Sin will deceive you if you allow it. Sin is powerful because it has a powerful influence on the mind. Romans 8 verse 5 says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires. <laughs> My mind is set. I used to work with an individual who used to say that. I've made up my mind, lad. My mind is set. <laughs> well, that, that can be a good thing, but very often it can also be not such a good thing. It's a powerful thing to do to set your mind, to make your mind up about a certain issue or situation and then be so determined that you're not going to change your mind. <laughs> to set your mind on sinful desires it's powerful, and it's powerful enough to kill you. Romans 8 verse 6 says, The mind of sinful man is death. A Christian, on the other hand, someone who's given their heart and life to Jesus Christ and received him in, into their life, given him the right to rule as Lord and Savior, set your mind for Jesus, to live for him, to follow him, committing your life to him, your future to him unswervingly. Now that is powerful. That is life changing. I want you to beware this morning. Think about it just for a moment. If you've set your mind, if you've decided, and nothing but no one is going to change your mind, make sure you've decided for life. <laughs> and not make the mistake of deciding for death. Sin is powerful. It's too powerful for you and for me to cope with on our own. Not in our own strength. But I do have some powerful good news today. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, we read it at the beginning, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the power of the Spirit of life set me free from the power of sin and death. So thirdly today, recognize the power of the Spirit of life. It would be a dreadful message today if... I ended up at this point by saying and talking about the power of sin and death. 
But it doesn't finish there, you'll be pleased to know. My message of power today is powerful because it ends with the power of the Spirit of life, the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verse 11 says, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Jesus is alive. In just a few weeks we'll be remembering at Easter time his death and, yes, his resurrection. Jesus is alive. He came back to life from death. The power of sin and death was defeated, totally overruled, destroyed. Death could not hold him. Because, why? Jesus was perfect. He had no sin. So death had no hold on him. No sin equals no death. And now because of that fact, you and I can know freedom from sin. The same spirit of life that raised Jesus from the dead, living in you, is the most powerful experience available to mankind. <laughs> Romans 8 verse 9, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. So, it's a simple question left for us to answer today. Here it is, which would you prefer to be con controlled by? A sinful nature that leads to death, or the Spirit of God which leads to life? Now, that's not a difficult question, is it? You don't need to go to university to work out the answer. Do you? Really? What are you going to really spend time considering? Is the choice a sinful nature that leads to death or the Spirit of God which leads to life? God's life living in you. And that means eternal life. Zoe life, Z-O-E, eternal life. <laughs> that means life where there's no trace of death. A good translation of that is absolute life. I heard a wonderful, brilliant illustration about absolute life, talking about absolute cold. Yeah. What is absolute cold? Well, I've forgotten the figure now, but I think it's minus 270-something <laughs> degrees. If you thought it was cold this morning at minus 1 or 2, imagine what it's like at minus 273, I think it is. That is cold. <laughs> that is absolute cold, all right? And, and absolute cold, the definition of that, all molecules stop moving. It's that, that cold. <laughs> Now, at that point, right, there is no trace of heat. That's what absolute cold means. No trace of heat at all. So absolute life, come on, means there's no trace of death. Wow, no evidence of death at all. Zoe life, eternal life. Wow. But my power... My powerful message is powerless unless you respond to it. If you agree to the words and yet reject its worth and don't do anything about it, then you're no better off. And as you accept and respond to the Holy Spirit in your life, allowing him to rule and reign, then he will set you free from the power of sin and death. Again, Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So, to be a child of God is, well, let's say, it's a fantastic thing, isn't it? Absolutely wonderful that's how we know. <laughs> That's what John says. You can know. Not hope that maybe when I die and go to, when I go to the, the pearly gates, 
And I'm asked, why should you let me into heaven? Well, I, I hope that I'll be good enough. Listen, it's nothing to do with works. It's not what you've done. It's what Jesus did. Okay? There's no hope. Maybe, possibly, might be, could be. You can know. John's gospel is full of you can know. You should know. You can know. He, you want, he wants you to know that your sins are forgiven. He wants you to know that you are on your way to heaven. He wants you to know eternal life that starts the moment you receive the power of the living Christ living in you. Wonderful. To be a child of God, to know with absolute assurance that God loves you, God cares for you, he has a plan for your life, a will and a way for you to walk. That's your identity. It's not your job. It's who you are in Christ. That's your identity. And he wants the best for you. You believe it. He wants the best for me. Bringing out all your personality that he designed you to fulfill and who you are. Bringing all your personal issues of life that would have taken you to death, issues of death that have been destroyed and put down, dealt with. To a father who really cares for you, do whatever he can as you call on him. When we live our lives in tune with God's will for us, we will then meet some really big hurdles and we need to get over them. Some big issues that might bring us to our knees. But in that, we triumph over them. So God has made a very powerful way for you and I to cope. And this is powerful today. Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You see, when, as a Christian... You live a life pleasing to God, hearing his voice, knowing his leading and following him, understanding his commandments and obeying. It's then that we are living the most powerful life possible. Powerful. The Holy Spirit living, leading, guiding, directing, instructing, strengthening, equipping, living in you, bringing you to ways of righteousness, the right way of doing things. To be a witness for Jesus, and as he commissioned you to say, as you go, I'll be with you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will be in you. In everything you say, everything you do, it will be powerful. A powerful testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. As George sh shared that Sunday evening in Kilmarnock, <laughs> he could identify very personally with Psalm 38. A psalm that is so traumatic when you read it and recognize what David was going through, understanding the pain and the trauma, the anguish of his heart that he's bowed down with grief, he cannot even look up, his bones are weak, his, his heart is racing away just enough to keep him alive, his fever in his body, it, it, it's... His wounds that are open and, and, uh, and sore and smelling. It, it just, oh, nobody wants to know you. George recognized his condition that he used to be like that. But then he met Jesus. Like David cried to God called out to God and said, come to me. 
I need you. I need you now. Lord, my Savior. And God came. He was forgiven of his sin. So, George cried out to Jesus and said, I need you. I need you now. And his life changed. As the power of sin and death was put to death on the cross of Calvary. And as George trusted in Jesus as his Lord and Savior, so his life changed. So he was set free to be all that God had called him to be. And so when he heard, as a child of God, the voice of God say, I want you to read Psalm 38. <laughs> And he came forward that Sunday night and whispered in my ear. Didn't tell me he was going to call it the smackhead psalm, though. <laughs> he left that as a surprise. <laughs> but when he read it, there were those in the congregation who needed to hear what he had experienced and recalled as David's experience so that they too could be set free from being powerless to living a life that's powerful. Not in their own strength, not in George's strength or ability or confidence. Bless him, it was all in Christ and he knew it. In everything he did, in everything he said, in everything you do, in everything you say, when you're in Christ, you're a new creature knowing his power at work in you, working through you and in you to bring life-changing, powerful messages to people who feel powerless. So what are you today? Powerless or powerful? I pray that as you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will know what it is to live a powerful life that's in Christ. Because when you are powerless, at just the right time, Christ died for you. Because God demonstrates his love for you in this. While you were still a sinner, Jesus died for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this powerful message that brings us from death to life, from darkness to light. A message that takes us from being powerless to powerful. We thank you for the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, dwelling in us, brings a whole new perspective, a whole new power in life that changes everything that our identity is found in Christ, not in what we do, but in who we are in him. I pray for those today who don't know you, that they will come to know you, that they will cry out like David cried and call to you like David called, that they will know that their sins are forgiven, that they have new life in Christ and be able to live in the power of Christ, the power that raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit leading, guiding, encouraging, equipping, and bringing them through to a new life that's found in you. O oh Lord, I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, if you want to know what it is to live that powerful life rather than being powerless, then please get in touch with the the information will be coming up on the screen. Get in touch with us. I'd love to be able to share more with you and pray with you to know that you have been set free from a powerless life that's ruled and reigned by death and sin to a life that's new in Christ, that's powerful because the Holy Spirit lives in you. God bless you. I'll see you again next week. 
and we look forward to being able to share again in God's Word. Bye-bye.